uh, good evening everyone uh, welcome to the um, ibrc lecture and today i am very excited to tell you that we are going to uh, uh, listen to a very interesting uh, story and uh, where a new platform has been developed which can be a game changer if we look at the background of antibiotic antibiotic resistance you all would know that the new antibiotics are really difficult to come by and in the previous uh, ibrc lecture we had heard the gram hackle and we had looked at the potential of bacteriophages as uh, antibacterial agents and today we'll be hearing from uh, professor ees breers from the university of ghent belgium and he is working on bacteriophage encoded endolysis and we briefly touched upon endolysis in the last uh, lecture where we learned that these enzymes are encoded by bacteriophages to break the cell wall and release their progeny but as you would know that in nature at the most one phage would have one pair of lysins whereas the need is for diverse lysins against diverse pathogens and so professor vees priors is going to talk on the topic from discovery to high throughput engineering of phage lysins targeting gram negative bacteria so most of us those of us who are microbiologists would know that gram negative bacteria have an extra barrier to their uh, cell wall peptidoglycan and that's what makes it a challenge to uh, let any small molecule or big molecule to get across this outer membrane and so we prior is is bryas is the scientist who has been working on this problem since a long time and um, i will introduce him to you first and then i will give a brief introduction of what he is going to present today so is bryas is associate professor at the department of biotechnology at ghent university belgium welcome professor he completed his phd in bioscience engineering at the department of biosystems in UN University in Belgium in 2008 and inspired by the early success of endolysis against gram positive pathogens he took the challenge to engineer endolysis with outer membrane penetrating peptides we call them OMPs so to create a effective enzybiotic effective against multiple drug resistant gram negative pathogens So these en engineered endolysins are cur currently commercialized as artilysins. Then, as a postdoctoral research fellow at ETH Zurich in the research group of Martin Losner, Professor Bries was granted a long-term fellowship from the European Molecular Biology Department. And in 2012, he returned to return as a postdoc to the group of Rob Levin at uh, UN University. where he focused on the engineering of the next generation endolysis against gram negative pathogens and since may 2015 he has established an independent research group at kent university uh, i had the privilege to visit him once and i could just learn about this fantastic platform that his group has developed so today he is here to share with us um and his research group focuses on the synthetic biology of the modular proteins with a keen interest in the engineering of phage encoded modular endolysins and tail fibers for by control of multi drug resistant pathogens and recently his group has established and this is the most significant uh, thing which uh, we are going to uh, learn about today uh, his group has established a platform uh, which called as versatile and this is a new dna assembly method for the rapid construction of combinatorial libraries of engineered lysins as you all would appreciate that lysins in nature would be of limited in limited number uh, a per phage but then through creating these uh, libraries of engineered lysins there is practically unlimited number of shuffled lysin sequences possible and this is what they have and second part of their work is that besides creating a library of these engineered lysins uh they have developed an iterative process to screen this library of lysins in a high throughput fashion so that they can identify the most effective most robust lysin 
and uh, that they have and then they do it in an iterative process that they have the library they screen it they check the one which has a good lighting activity and then they subject it to a second round and through this iterative process uh, this process is something similar to the lead development of classic pharmaceutical drugs development they have also developed implemented a similar iterative strategy to establish a hit to lead development process and they identified a lead license variant which uh, uh, east breers will tell us in short time and this approach uh, uh, the significant part is that this approach is generic in nature so though he, his lab is right now focusing on i mean his general focus is on modular proteins and he is presenting on license phage and coded license and so they have the huge potential to fill this gap that since no new antibiotics are coming can these license be developed can be the new drugs in market and so and the, the other advantage of this platform is that it is applicable to any modular protein so uh, whether it is an industrial protein and protein with an industrial application or medical application or any other application this could be applied to any of those modular protein so uh, this is indeed a fascinating i mean when i learned about it i was like i thought most of us should know about it and realize the potential of this platform and so with this brief introduction i would now request professor is prayers to uh, tell us his platform tell us about his platform and i welcome him on behalf of all of us thank you so much yeah, thank you very much uh, urmi so from my side uh, a very good evening in asia a very good afternoon in, in europe and a very good early morning in, in the US or in the Americas. Uh, thank you for the kind invitation, Urmi, for the extensive introduction and uh, the, the opportunity to present today about our latest research of phage license targeting, targeting gram-negative bacteria. I would like to start with a very small movie that I came across this week in my Twitter feed. I, I don't think it's published already, uh, but what you see here, or Staphylococcus aureus bacteria that are infected by phage SA2. In real time, you can see the lysis process. So it looks a bit like firework because they added a, a dye that stains the bacterial DNA that's released. But it is one of the most spectacular visualizations I've seen before uh, for phage lysis. And that's the topic of today. Phage lysis is very spectacular, but basically it's caused by a very simple and also relatively small protein, the endolysin. Just to give you a concise overview, an endolysin accumulates in the cytosol of the infected cell, and at a genetically pre-programmed time point, the holins that accumulate in the cytoplasmic membrane oligomerize and they form pores. And then at a very sudden moment, the endolysins are released to the periplasm or to the peptide glycan layer and they start to degrade the, the cell wall. And this is a very sudden uh, activity, as you could see in, in, in the previous uh, uh, movie. And this is also important for the fish, that, that they, they keep the cell intact and, and relatively healthy until the very end, as long as they produce and make the phage particles, the cell should be in good state. This is a very simple model. If you want to learn more about this, I refer to the very extensive work of uh, the lab of Ryland Young at the Texas University because they have uh, elaborated many, many different uh, phage lysis systems. So that's the, the endolysin. The endolysin plays an important role at the end, at the lysis, uh, at the end of the, the, the replication cycle. But there is a second phage lysin encoded by the phage, and that's important during the infection stage, especially when the genome has to be injected. Prior to that, a little hole has to be made in the cell wall. And this hole is made by what I call the structural lysin. It is a lysin which has the same biochemical activity as the endolysin, but since it's structurally associated with a viral particle, the activity is very local and limited to keep the cell intact, just the hole must be large enough to inject the genome. Lysins are, in fact, an umbrella term. They cover enzymes with a very high diversity. First of all, at the level of the enzymatic specificity, we call that the biochemical diversity. 
If you look to the meshwork of peptide glycan of gram negatives at the left or gram positives at the right, you see that endolysins or lysins in general can cleave many different bonds of the peptide glycan meshwork. So we have different enzymatic specificities. All of them are called lysins. Secondly, there is also a huge structural diversity. Some lysins have a globular fold, meaning that they comprise a single domain. This is then the enzymatically active domain. But many other lysins, so the majority of gram-positive lysins, have a modular structure. So besides one enzymatic active domain, they comprise at least also a cell wall binding domain. We recently made a survey of the more than 10,000 um, annotated uh, phage lysons in the Unipro database. And here you see just a, a snapshot of that. You see all the gram positive genera, uh, the, the gram negative genera. And on the x axis, you see the 12 different CBDs which have been uh, annotated uh, in a detailed way and 29 different EIDs. And depending on which genus is attacked by the phage, the endolysins and the structural lysins have different CBDs or EADs. Some are typical for some genera, while others are used in more different uh, genera. So there's a huge structural diversity in terms of CBD and EAD composition. It's not only the composition, we analyzed also the, the order. Uh, in fact, nature has these building blocks and nature has tried everything. And by horizontal transfer, they have fused once every EAD to every CBD. And throughout natural evolutions, the, the best ones have been retained. Uh, the best ones are those that are most fit to perform their biological function. And if, if you look, for example, to the ME2 domain, uh, it's an EAD, which is very widespread. You see that this often precedes, for example, the CW7, the CW1, because there's a blue connection with it. Also the lit M, but there's no connection, for example, with the SH3. So uh, you see that certain combinations are more prevalent than other ones. So this is our, a kind of natural design rules that have emerged throughout nature's evolution. So the na nature has a huge collection of building blocks and they try out all combinations and they retain the best ones. That is natural evolution. When I was an undergraduate, that was in 2004, uh, 16 years ago, I was very much inspired by the first uh, work about using endolysins against gram positives. A gram positives have an externally exposed cell wall with the peptide glycan layers at the external site. And when you add the purified lysin to them, it immediately starts degrading the peptide glycan layer. You get a hole and through the, the pressure inside the cell, the cytosol is uh, extruded. And, and I guess you believe me, this cell is immediately dead. This is a picture of the Fischetti lab. They, they published first on that in 2001. But there was also the group of Martin Lerstner in Switzerland. They were more focusing this in the field of uh, food microbiology. So this was very inspiring work. But we decided to move and to focus on phage lysins targeting gram negatives. So there were several reasons for that. First of all, I did my master's thesis in the lab, uh, where also Rob Lavigne was at that time a PhD student. And he was starting to sequence a lot of pseudomonozygonosa genomes. So we have a high and good access to to high quality genomes of uh, these gram negative phages. Secondly, there was not um, too much uh, research done already on phage lysin starting gram negatives. Uh, the most famous one that time was the T4 lysin design. This has been extensively studied in the 70s and it was a model protein to study protein folding. Also the D7 lysin design, uh, the endolysin of phage T7, it's in fact an amidase, but at that time they called everything a lysin design. It's very famous because it interacts with the this D7 RNA polymerase in the PET expression system. And the lysin design was famous because it was studied by the group of Rylern as a canon canonical endolysin to study the phase lysin system. But apart from that, there was only very sketchy research on that uh, topic. 
But the most important reason is maybe this list. This list has been published in 2017 by the WHO, and this is the list of the priority pathogens for which new RD for new antibiotic is urgently needed. And if you look to this list, you see that nine out of the 12 species or genera are all gram negative, especially the three critical ones are all gram negative. And this is also true when you speak with clinical microbiologists in, in, in the hospital, and they recognize the problems with the, the gram positive ones, but in the case of gram negative pathogens, the, the number of therapeutic options that remain available are even more scarce. So that's where the, the triggers to, to focus on the uh, uh, phage license. What is the name of this list? Is that the question? Yeah, I didn't get it that. So that's where the main reasons to focus on gram negative okay. bacteria. So if you look to the, the cell wall of, of gram negatives, then we see that the peptide, the glycan layer itself, is not problematic. It's a very thin layer. So compared to gram positives, they have often up to 40 layers. So you, you need many cuts to get through the peptide and glycan layer. This is not the case with gram negatives. If you get there, it's very easily cleaved and you get osmotic lysis. In addition, it's also conserved. All the gram negatives have what we call the hemotype A1 gamma. They have the same, same chemical structure of uh, peptide and glycan. This is not the case with gram positives. There you have a high diversity. But the problem, of course, as, as Unmi also said in her Introduction is the outer membrane. This is an, a formidable barrier, uh, which is uh, both blocking hydrophobic substances, but also hydrophilic substances. And only very small molecules of 600 Dalton or smaller can pass through uh, the purines. Lysins are much larger, uh, larger. The smallest ones are about 12,000 Dalton. So they cannot pass through that. So that, that was the challenge we took about uh, 15 years ago. Okay, we, so we started 15 years ago, and here you see an overview of a decade of uh, discoveries of new phage lysons and, and the biochemical characterizations of them. It's uh, the interesting thing about this list is that all these lysons have been characterized with the same methods. There are a lot of methods in literature, how, how can you analyze their biochemical activity? Uh, but uh, but this, this list is analyzed by the same method. You, you see the range of uh, activities uh, expressed in units per micromole. And the first thing I want to say here is that there is a huge difference between the least active one and the highest active one. There's a range of a 300 fold activity increase. So it's also clear in this list that the most active ones are the modular license. So they are very scarce among gram negative targeting license. But if you find one, you have a good chance that it will have a high activity because they are much higher than in activity than the global ones. There's one analyzer I would like to highlight a bit during this talk today. It's a paper which is from our group, which is currently under revision. And this is a license that we discovered in um, an Asinopactor Baumani uh, phage. In fact, it was not hard to discover because it was very, very similar to many other already described licenses, more than 95%. But we, we delved a bit deeper into that. And there are two points I would like to highlight uh, today. First of all, this license has no MIC value. So it has no minimum inhibitory concentration. We tested up to 1,000 microgram per ml, and it could not inhibit the Asintobacter bamani strains. And it's because it cannot permeate the outer membrane in miller hinton growth. But what we found is when we com combine this with, um, with, with cholestin, and we tested the cholestin sensitive strains, which have an, a MIG value of one to two microgram per ml. If you combine that with the endolyzer on this MK34, you see that there is a significant drop in the MIG value, a fourfold reduction. This has also been published by other people, but we were in the occasion to also 
study this effect on collagen resistance strains. So these are plant drug resistance strains. And there, you even get a higher reduction. You go from 8 to 32 microgram per mil to a 16-fold reduction. And this is very interesting because you have to know that the breakpoint for sensitivity is 4 microgram per mil. So in fact, you resynthesize these strains to collagen when you include um, about 8 microgram per mL of the lysine. That's very interesting because one of the strains we tested was multidrug resistant. It was resistant against all therapeutic options except one that was cholestine. If the no cholestine is the last resort antibiotic and it also causes undesired side effects. And if you would treat the patient with this, this bug, you have to use colistin, but if you could combine this with this endolysin, then, um, then you will need lower doses of colistin. I have lower risk of colistin resistant development. And using lower doses also reduces the risks of uh, undesired side effects. So this kind of uh, lysin would be interesting to use in combination with uh, colistin as a last resort antibiotic. The second aspect I would like to emphasize for this kind of lysin is that we found that it, a turbo, it has a turbo pressure dependent antibacterial activity. When we treated the cells with the lysin, we noted that there was a bacterial count reduction about three log. So 99.9% .9 of the cells was killed. This was not new and there are other similar lysins described in, in literature that have the same activity, they call it an intrinsic antibacterial activity. So for some reason, this lysin is able to permeate the outer membrane. And likely this has to do with the amphipathic helix in the C-terminus that interferes with the stability of the outer membrane. And this effect can even be increased when you add EDTA to that. But when we repeated the same experiment with cells with a low internal pressure, we see that this effect completely drops away. And so you get a high turbo pressure if you suspend the cells in the low tonicity buffer. I think we, we, we use the 20 millimolar HIPAS, and then the cells have a high turbo pressure. They're, they're like a balloon. And when you, you use a, a buffer with a lot of salt in it, you get a low turbo pressure. And you can explain these results if you make the comparison with a fully blown uh, balloon that you try to to let explode with a needle. It's much easier when, when the balloon is fully blown than when it's almost empty. That, that's the same. And with a high turbo pressure, you get a high antibacterial activity with a low turbo pressure, not. This can be compensated with EDTA. You regain the high activity. And you can also get the cell slice when, after the treatment, you apply an osmotic shock. You suspend the cells again in a buffer that causes a high turbo pressure and then the cells eventually lie. So the lysin, in fact, sublaterally damages the cells. And this is important to know. And so there are many papers that report on intrinsic bacterial antibacterial activity. But I think as a community, we should have more attention to this aspect, so the, the kind of buffer you use to resuspend your cells, and also the buffer that you use to dilute the cell suspension before you plate them. This is a detail which is mostly not mentioned in the material and methods, but we have shown here that this has an effect on the antibacterial activity. So this, this, this uh, take home message I also want to bring in this, um, uh, this uh, talk. Okay, but now I want to turn to the arteriolysis. This is a solution we have uh, presented and, and published about six years ago. It's a solution that works very well to catch the endolysin or the, the lysin in general through the outer membrane. So as you know, and also told in the introduction, endolysins targeting gram positives have immediate access to the peptidic lichen. But if you want to kill a gram negative, you need something to get through this outer membrane. And this works remarkably well with a peptide, an outer membrane permalizing peptide that is fused to the endolysin. Uh, the examples I will show today is, is all related to Artelizin 175, which has such a peptide from a sheep, from the innate immunity of sheep, and a non endolysin of uh, a Pseudomonas aeruginosa phage. This combination was very successful and is meanwhile commercialized under the trademark of Artelizin 
by the company Lysando. And it's always nice to, to show this movie where you see the mode of action. And so you add the arcalyzin to the cells. And this is a very nice example. This cell, you see that the a hole is punctured and the cytosol comes out and then the cell eventually locks. So in fact, by fusing this outer membrane peptides, you, you have almost the same mode of action as you see for gram-positive lysins killing gram-positive pathogens. The second movie shows how, how quick it can act. So this is a new movie with an increased dose of the arcalysin. You see acinobacter cells, and the timestamp is at minus 10. And I will start the movie, and when the timestamp is zero, then you will see a flow of arcalysin. And what you see immediately when you add the arcalysin, the cell lies. So it's an immediate effect on contact. Eh? Arcalysins and lysins in general belong to the most fast acting antibiotics. So, we published several papers about that. I just recap here a bit. Uh, the, the major features are is that they act very rapidly, as you could see in the movie, that you get a high bactericidal effect. We got uh, quantifications up to eight logs of stationary cells in the case of Asymptobacterium. We found no cross resistance with at least 12 resistant mechanisms, including colosseum resistance, which was uh, a good news uh, for this kind of uh, proteins. We also tried to induce resistant development by vertical transfer, but this, this was unsuccessful. At least in our hands, we could not provoke resistant development. Another nice feature, which is also general for phage lysins, is that they kill persistence. They cannot be killed by traditional antibiotic. Uh, but they are an important source of chronic infections, so it's a good uh, feature that lysins can kill them because they don't need an active metabolism of the bacteria. This is just a case study of Lysando. They have uh, published a few of them on their website. You can also click on the YouTube link uh, below on this slide. This is a dog. He had a chronic co infection that was unsuccessfully treated for 12 months. And when you start using lysins, uh, then, then they had a good success in healing this one between, uh, it took four to five weeks. After finding the first RT lysins, we were curious if we could modulate the activity, if we could play with, with uh, antibacterial properties like the, the, the activity, the specificity, and so on. And this is a study that took four years to construct 49 different RT lysins, we played around with them with different peptides, different enzymatically active domains. We combined different peptides. We included linkers. So all kinds of variants we could think of at that time. We all purified these proteins and we tested the antibacterial activity. And what we found is that it's, it's very variable. Uh, here we compared different peptides and uh, you see only one uh, peptide was truly the best all the other ones have a moderate activity or even known activity or very low activity also the endolysin methods if you take this good peptide and you fuse it to different endolysins you see that with some endolysins you get a good activity but many others you get a very low activity so it's not so difficult to get a low or moderate activity but to find the truly best ones the hits that, that asks a lot of effort. The same for the linker. Eh? Some, it is a case study where you see that in, if you increase the linker length, that we got a better activity. So we were faced with the fact that, that we see that there is a huge potential when bringing the right components together, you can find the ideal engineered license, but it's truly hard to find the best ones. And this was, a bit frustrating, or maybe that's not the right word, but this, this made it very curious. How can we analyze more variants? Because there's a lot of potential in that. And from this curiosity, we turned back to, to basic gene technology and we were creative and we came up with a new method, which is the main topic of today, and that's the versatile technology. I will try to explain this as good as possible, but I, I start very simple. Basically, you can explain versatile as playing with Lego. And you know Lego, if, if you want that your kids play with Lego, you go to the shop, you buy a box of building blocks, 
you give it to them and then they can make any construction of that. Basically, we do the same with phage license. So first step is to make a repository of all building blocks and we call them tiles. A tile is corresponding to a peptide, a linker, an enzymatically active domain or a cell wall binding domain. And we have versatile cloning protocols to make all these tiles compatible with the versatile technology. And once you have this repository, then you have your, uh, that, that's your richness. Once you have them, you can do everything. You can pick four tiles, you mix them in a tube, and with a rational assembly, you stitch them together with short hands, hands on time. But you can do something different. You can take as many building blocks as you have, you combine them all in a single tube, in a single reaction, and on next day, all clones will have a different combination of peptides, linkers, CBDs, and EADs. And this goes literally up to millions of variants that you create in a single day once you have this tau repository. So how does that work? I go a little bit more detail. We go first to the versatile cloning protocol, that's to make the tiles. What is the tile? You start always with a coding sequence, for example, for cell binding domain, and then you have to flank it with position tags. These are blocks of six nucleotides that come left and right, and the five prime and the three prime end of the coding sequence, and that label the position. So coding sequences that have to end up at position one in your final assembly need uh, the green and the yellow position tag. For the position two, you have other position tags and so on. And note that adjacent position tags always have to be the same six nucleotides. That's what we call a tau. A tau is a coding sequence uh, in combination with the two flanking position tags. And this sequence has to be cloned in the first tau entry vector to make it compatible with the system. Okay, that's step one. Then we move on to the versatile shuffling. That's the, the assembly step. If you want to do a rational assembly step, if you want to combine four different tiles, you take tile one out of box one, tile two out of box two, one for position three and one for position four and so on. You mix it with the destination vector, which has a selectable marker, also with two position tags. So the green one corresponds to this one, the red one to the last one. You do the assembly reaction and you get your library after a transformation. It takes 50 minutes and some time. On the next day, you can analyze these clones and 95% of them, at least, will have the correct assembly. So it's now very easy, once you have the repository, to make any combination that you have in mind and that you want to investigate. How does it look like yeah, in the destination vector? It comes between the promoter and the terminator and the purification tag and all the tiles are concatenated. And between the different coding sequences of the parts, the peptide, the linker, the CBD, and the EAD, there are six nucleotides encoding for two amino acids that form a little but flexible scar. But it, it, it becomes truly interesting when you go to combinatorial assembly. Then, in that case, you can combine many different tiles for position one, you mix them all in a single tube, you make a tile mixture of them, and you do that for every position. And then you mix these mixtures with the destination vector, you do the same assembly reaction, you do the transformation, it takes a little bit more time because you have to pipe it more. But on the next day, every clone will have a different variant, again with a 95% assembly efficiency. So if you use very big plates, and you can have thousands of clones in every one, will have a different variant. But then, after having this technique, the next hurdle comes. We, we, we solved the technical hurdle of making many variants, which was a very tough job before we had Virtutel. Then you have to be able to analyze them all. Analyzing all is not yet possible at this moment, but how we did do it, how we did it is using a um, parallel expression and testing assays. So we use deep well plates. Every deep well is filled with half ml of auto induction medium. You inoculate it with a, with a variant, it's grown in here, and with chloroform vapor, we make a lysate of that. And these lysates are then mixed with 
with the pathogen you want to test. Uh, you mix them 50-50, you let it grow overnight, and after an overnight grow, you measure the optical density. So it means that the lower the bar is, the more growth inhibition there was by the variant. So if you analyze the plate, and you, this is an average result you can get. Then, For example, the green one here, the variant C8, is one with a very low optical density. So this means that the growth of the, the bacterium has been completely blocked. That is just the background optical density. Typically, when you have a hit, the optical density, the standard deviation of it, is also very low. You have a few other intermediate hits, but the majority is not uh, inhibited. So once again, you see that making an, an engineered lysine with a peptide that can pass the outer membrane is, the, is not just adding a peptide to a lysine, with the right linker, no, you need some luck. Eh? There is only a small hit rate. And that's why Versatile was so interesting because now we are able to make many variants. And now we're also able to find more these rare hits like uh, exemplified in this, uh, in this graph. So what follows in this presentation are three uh, case uh, studies um, where we have applied Versatile. Um, the first example, we will look how we can find an engineered lysine uh, against a very specific condition. More specifically, we wanted to find an engineered phage lysine targeting Acinetobacter bomani. Remember, uh, this, this, this species was on top of the WHO list. Mm -hmm. And we wanted it to be active under human serum conditions. This is not trivial at all because human serum is in general quite aggressive um, environment for uh, lysins. So we use this approach. This is the blueprint of our approach with the versatile technology. First, we used versatile cloning to make a tau repository of peptides, linkers, CBDs, and EADs. And with versatile shuffling, we made a large library. This is then followed by a high throughput screening approach eh, on growth inhibition, as I have just shown you. And when you do your first screening, you, 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 you sequence by Sanger sequencing the hits, and you try to extract, extract the samples. I explained in the very beginning how our nature and natural evolution also implements kind of design rules to, to, to make the right combinations of the naturally available building blocks. We try to do that the same in a lab space. And that's basically what protein engineering is. If you have this design rule, you can easily return to your tau repository. And with first of all shuffling, you make a new library with these design rules implemented. So you make a smarter and a rich library, which you start screening again, and then you have an iterative cycle, and you can go ahead as long as you want until you have the lead that has the activity that you wish. Okay, so we started with a library where we use 38 peptides at position one, two linkers at position two, six CBDs at position three, and 21 EADs at position four. So if you sum that, you have just 67 tiles mm, that you may compile with the system. But if, if you then multiply these numbers and calculate how many different constructs you can make, well, then we had a number of approximately 10,000 different assemblies. And once you have the 67 tiles, on the next day, you have a library with this variation. We sequenced this library with Nanopore, which is a single molecule sequencing technology. And we had, uh, we analyzed 30,000 uh, variants. And um, we could see that at least 99 variants of the library were present in the library. So it's a pretty unbiased assembly protocol to get all these variants in your library. Okay, then we did the first screening. And we decided to screen against Acinetobacter bomani, and we selected four different strains, which have caused epidemies in, in you know, three of them in Europe and one in the US um, uh, in the last years. And from the 380 variants we randomly picked, we found a hit rate of 2%. So seven hits were found, only seven hits. So we were really looking for the needle in the hay uh, pile, in the haystack. 
So we, you need some luck and you need to screen a lot. From these seven variants, the majority, three of them, was only active against one strain. And two of them were active against two strains, and one was active against three, and one was active against four strains, including the multi-drug resistant strains we had in our panel. So that was the, the first situation. Then we looked to the sequence of these seven hits. And this is the situation before we did the screening. And this is the, the distribution of all the outer membrane permalyzing peptides in our library. So all uh, 38 peptides that are used are present, uh, almost the same proportion. And after the, the screening, in the seven hits, you see that four peptides were enriched. Uh, three of them had OMP7, one had OMP11, OMP30 were two, and OMP35 were once again one. Interestingly, OMP7 and OMP11 were both belonging to the same class of peptides, the cyclopin uh, peptide class of uh, peptides. So that was very interesting to see that among the hits, there were two peptides enriched that had uh, almost the same uh, secondary structure. So we decided to make a new library, and we said instead of using all these 38 peptides, we will only use the cyclopin-like peptides that are available in our tau re repository. And the same, we do the same we did for the CBDs. We used six CBDs, but we see that two CB CBDs were more prevalent in the hits. So we made a new library, and this was now very easy. It's a big job to make the tau repository, but once you have it, it's just a small step to make a new library. So we used the four cyclopin-like uh, peptides we had in the repository, the same two linkers, the same EIDs, but the CVDs we also reduced the two. So we used 29 tiles and we got a new library which was enriched and much more, 336 uh, different assemblies. Again, we screened this library, we screened about 188 variants, and here you see the results. Uh, the, the first library in blue. You see here, on the, on the x axis, you see the four different assemblobacter strains. And on the y axis, you see the bacterial growth. So the lower this value, the higher the inhibition of the lysine invariant. The, the, the first screen I have just shown you are the blue bars. And they're just a few hits that have a full inhibition. But in the second library, which is the green bars, you see there are many more hits that have a complete inhibition of the four different strains. In general, uh, the distribution is larger. You have also many bad hits in the new library, but the proportion increased. Instead of 2% hits, we now get 21% hits. So we have now 40 candidate engineered licenses that were active on four different uh, strains, uh, or, or one of the four different strains. So you see also that the proportion of them that was active against the four different strain increased. I hear it's more than 50%, while in the first screening, it was only a minority. So this was, a, I think, a very important finding because this learned us that by looking to the results of the first screening, by sequencing the hits and to analyzing which building blocks are prevalent, that we can learn from that, implement that, and make, make it first to tell the new library and we saw that we get a higher hit rate. That's exactly the aim of protein engineering. So the principle we had in mind worked. Okay. Then we did the third screening. We had this 40 hits of the second screening. And we continued with the 24 hits with the broadest activity. These are the hits that were active against at least three different strains. And now we started testing under more stringent conditions. The previous testings was in, in standard medium. Now we switch to human serum. And from these 24 hits, five remained acti active in these stringent conditions. And there was one, which we call our lead, one lead lysin that was active against all tested strains in serum. So that was the, the iterative screen with three screening rounds using Versatile to end up with one variant that was active in human serum targeting all the strains of our panel. So the hit rate is not very high, and it's thanks to Versatile, I believe, that we could find this one. 
So we characterized this leak molecule and it confirmed our expectations. It had a good minimum inhibitory concentration against a relatively broad panel of 53 strains, and many of them were multi drug resistant. There was variation between 4 and 24 microgram per ml, but these are very acceptable values. It got a good bactericidal activity. It was strain dependent, but uh, up to five log reduction within one hour in human serum. And surprisingly, when we first studied this lysin, we found that it has a novel mode of action. Um, I've shown you before the, the movies of Artelizin 175, where you see that the cells explode like in the phage induced lysis. Well, when we start analyzing those strains and this lysin, we see that there are just small blebs along the side of the septum mostly that are uh, causing the cell to die. So the lead molecule that we found had a surprisingly novel mode of action as well. That is the first example. That's also the example that has been recently uh, published uh, in, in Science Advances. The second example, I want to show you how you can use Versatile to do a quick evaluation of different configuration of engineered lysis. What do I mean with that? In the previous uh, case study, I show you uh, 10,000 variants with this configuration. You get one P in the beginning, then a linker, followed by a CBD, and then an EAD. But why not doubling the OMP, one in the beginning, one in the end, or two at the beginning, or two at the end, or just switching the position of the OMP from the N terminus to the C terminus? If you have the tiles, you can easily make all these different uh, configurations. For this project, we made additional tiles. Uh, we made peptides for every position. The linker was only needed at position two and three, because there's only a linker at position two and three. CBD is at the first three positions, and EID is at the last three positions. Okay. If you just make now a simple multiplication of these numbers, then we can make 40,000 variants of configuration one, 200,000 variants of configuration two, and so on. Uh, and if you sum this number, uh, you have uh, almost a in, 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 uh, ridiculous uh, ridiculously high number of variants that you can make with uh, slightly more than 200 tiles. Okay. Then, um, what we did too then is that we picked 188 variants of every configuration so that sums up to 940 engineered lysons uh, that we test in total without and uh, with EDTA. And uh, without is, are the green dots, and in red, you have the, the analysis with the EDTA. Again, here on the y axis, you see the growth inhibition. In this graph, it's expressed as a percentage. So the higher the value, the higher the growth inhibition, with 100% representing a full inhibition. And we did that for the the five uh, different configurations. So this is a truly high number. I, I, I often tell uh, the, the PSD student who did that, that this is likely uh, a world record, that this high number of licenses that could be screened. But here, when you compare the different configurations, you see an interesting uh, uh, view. You see that many of them show some growth inhibition, a very moderate effect, but in four out of the five configurations, you see that there are clusters of top hits. They are a bit separated from the bulk of the variants. And so here is the median. And the median value of this configuration is even 0% growth inhibition, which is a bit higher here too, here's zero again. But what we are actually looking for is these top hits. And the most interesting configuration in this setup was configuration one. While well, configuration three with two on P's in the beginning gave no top hits at all. Right? But in the other ones, you could find top hits that were active without uh, EDTA uh, as shown by the green dots. So this is the strength, I think, of Versatile. Um, once you have this building box, you can ask yourself this kind of questions and analyze this on a high throughput uh, scale. Okay, and the third example I want to show you is, is, is how you can develop new antibacterial concepts. And this is work that was being initiated by our collaboration uh, partners, Antina Zampara, who has graduated in the meantime. 
she was uh, doing a PhD in the, in the group of Leonard Bromstedt, and they came to us with an idea, what will happen if we fuse a phage receptor binding protein to a lysine? Mm -hmm. So we use a, a protein of the phage tail, mm -hmm. uh, specifically we use PB5, it's a protein of phage T5, uh, a Nikolai phage, and this interacts with an outer membrane protein, mm -hmm. with FUA. Okay. This part interacts with that. And we were interested to see what happened if you fuse that protein to a lysine, and we use the end lysine of the same phage of T5, and we make one fusion protein. And we want to see what happens. And we, we, we made a design with, with 12 different variants, uh, with the T5 uh, lysine in the N terminus and the PB5 in the C terminus. Uh, we also used the truncated variant of PB5. So the blue bar is the, the blue block is the, the, the receptor binding protein. If you can do it in the opposite direction, you can do it without linkers or you can put linkers in between. So if you start designing, you, you quickly come up with a few variants that can be interesting. Now we tested them and one of them appeared to be active. It was the variant number six. We, we, we coined this, this kind of fusion, the inolysin. So inolysin number six showed a good growth inhibitory effect. And the y-axis is the optical density after an overnight growth. And this variant uh, almost fully inhibited uh, the growth of E. coli. So we found the hit. And interestingly, Athena could also confirm that this hit was truly dependent on this outer membrane receptor. Because if you made a deletion mutant of this protein, you see that the activity, the antibacterial activity, drops away completely. Okay. But you see also here on this graph, the log reduction that we could obtain was one log. So 90% is killed. And this maybe looks good, but it, it's not yet good enough. It's not yet good enough to be a good candidate for an antibiotic. Okay? You need at least two or three uh, logs. So she continued to work with versatile and she designed many more variants with different linkers and different endolysins um, with the PB5. And this was not so complicated with versatile, you can quickly do that. She analyzed, uh, she analyzed a large number of them. She did first an initial screening for growth inhibition. She took the top leads. She did also a myrolytic assay. And in the pyramid or in the, in the funnel wise, she came to the final lead and this one showed 3.3 log killing of an extended spectrum beta lactamase uh, producing uh, E. coli strain. So again, I think you see here the merits of Versatile. First of all, Versatile was used to explore a new idea, a new concept, and we found a hit, albeit with a low activity. But then later on with Versatile, you can do true synthetic biology of these molar proteins, and you can make a lot of variants and find the best variants. So that, that are the two interesting things you can do uh, with first stop. So that brings me to my conclusions. I hope I could convey the message that, that first of shuffling is a generic and, and robust method yeah, for the rapid assembly for libraries of phage slidens, but not only phage slidens, as, as Urmio already said in the introduction, it's generic and you can use it for any modular protein. Secondly, um, if you implement an iterative engineering approach in different cycles and you try to, to learn from, the, from the every cycle and to extract design rules, and then you just simple reuse, simply reuse the building blocks, the tiles you have already, you can quickly improve the activity of your protein. And thirdly, um, in fact, what we have done now very much looks to the classic hit for lead the development of small molecule drugs that you see in the pharmaceutical industry. And to, to illustrate that, this is a, a figure from the field of the pharmaceutical industry. And if, you, if they look for a new drug, then the organic uh, chemistry scientists in the company, they will make libraries of thousands of components using organic chemistry. And the biologists, they make high throughput uh, screening assays that, that look for the drugs that that have uh, the desired activity in, in a biological assay. 
And so in this way, in iterative approach stepwise, they do the hit to lead optimization. And when they find when they find a few hits, they will look to the structure of these hits. And then they turn this information back to the chemist and they will make a new library, uh, which is smarter, but also smaller. And then they analyze again this library. So basically it's the same what is already for years or decades the standard in the pharmaceutical industry. We have now mimicked to um, what you can do with phase license. And I think that's truly a cool thing because the mod modularity principle of phase license is, is likely one of the features that sets license the most apart from other antibiotics. It's not just a single antibiotic. No, license have the potential to, to be developed and engineered against any pathogen under any condition. You can even imagine that so far that one day, uh, it's not yet possible uh, from the legal perspective at the moment, but one day you could get an isolator of the patient and you could search large libraries of model license and to look for the best license for this particular isolate that can help this patient the best. I think we, can, we will move more and more to the customization of license and this will be helpful to the fuel, the pipeline, the preclinical pipeline, I have to say, of uh, license. So then leads me to thank you for your attention. And I would also thank the many people that have been co-developing um, the versatile technology. We use them for a lot of different proteins, also other proteins and phase license. The work I've shown today was mostly developed by Hans and Dennis, Jörn, uh, Steph and Karim, Elisa and Diana. But also a big thank you to, to Martin, who did uh, a lot of work in the development of the art license. And all of this has been based also on the long-term uh, collaboration with uh, Rob Lavin of the uh, University of Leuven. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, thank you, Ease, so much. This was very informative, and I'm sure um, a lot of people would have got exciting ideas on how to shuffle the different uh, uh, domains in a protein and create wonderful combinations. And then, of mm -hmm. course, we need to have patients to screen them to find, as you said, the needle in the haystack. But to know the, you need to have a good haystack to find the needle. So that I'm sure you've been able to successfully clear, create. So I thank you very much once again for this wonderful talk. And uh, I am getting some, now is the time for questions. Um, I have seen, uh, I'm seeing several questions in the chat box and some people requested that they want to have one-to-one -one chat with you, uh, which is like they want to uh, ask questions directly to you. But my apologies to, um, because you know, maybe we'll not be able to regulate the noise because who asks first, that may be a problem. So Vijay, is it okay if we go ahead with reading the questions from the chat box? Uh, sure, maybe, sure uh, Matt. Yeah, okay. So, um, so I'll actually, because maybe we, several people might ask at the same time and we may lose. Uh, so uh, the ease, can I go ahead with the questions which I can see on the chat box? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so the first question is, uh, um, how do endolysins affect, can kill the, e can get across the EPS uh, in biofilms? Um, it's yeah. not directly to the, uh, it's a general question. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good question. I think this is dependent on the strain and the capsule. You have to know a capsule is, is, is polysaccharides and basically these are long kind of uh, chains that make a meshwork, a network, and uh, it's not a wall, it's not a, 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 a one wall, no, it's a network with big holes, and, and, and depending on how dense this network is, license can penetrate through it or not. But it seems that in the majority of the cases, license can pass through uh this uh, exopolysaccharide yeah? but i can imagine if you use some very mucoid strains which have a very dense network of exopolysaccharide 
that that they that they will limit the diffusion of such uh, lighting. So, but it seems uh, with the knowledge which is now available in the literature, uh, especially also with gram positives, that that the capsule does not pose uh, a restriction. Also, when we compare the mix values among a panel of different isolates, we don't see a true correlation between between capsulated or non-capsulated strains. So. I think the answer is positive there that in the majority of the cases, the EPS doesn't form um, a problem. Okay. So I may not be able to take all the questions in the same order, but uh, this question is from Vijay Singh. Uh, he asks, why you opted three amino acids in linkers? Don't you think increasing diversity in linker structure can increase the activity of our modern tiles? So you mean the... the you mean the amino acids that are intervening the two uh, adjacent uh, building blocks? Yes, the linkers, yeah. Yeah, yeah. indeed. Uh, we have opted for two. It, are, it is always glycine or serine or alanine. These are the three smallest amino acids, and that was on purpose because we wanted to, uh, to keep flexibility so that the CBDs and the EIDs and the peptides could move autonomously um, uh, compared to each other. Um, but the method can be easily adopted that it becomes three or four or even five amino acids. But we rather um, focused on that by introducing a linker between the peptide and, and the CBD and the endolite. There, we use linkers that are between five and I believe something about 20 or 25 different amino acids. So you can play with this, this two amino acids in the middle, but you can also say, okay, we take position X, X as a tile, and we make a linker tile of that, and you have the, the full flexibility there. Great. There was another question on same, uh, the length of the linker, so I think they would have got the answer. Now, then another question is, as you mentioned, the a bomini endolysins has an ampipath amphipathic helix for permeating the cell membrane. So does this mean that they do not require the holins during cell lysis? Um, the endolysins have an amphi amphipathic helix which might help them get across the membrane yeah, by themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mentioned this amphipathic helix in the perspective when, when you treat a bacterium with this purified lysin from the outside. And some lysins, like the LIS MK34 that I showed in this presentation, have an amphipathic helix that appears to interfere with the stabilizing forces of the outer membrane. So the outer membrane is stabilized by ionic interactions and hydrophobic interaction. And an amphipathic helix is a helix which is hydrophobic at one side and cationic at the other side. And this combined property, which is on the surface of such a lysin, can destabilize its forces. So I, I didn't mention this amphiphatic helix in the biological role where a lysin and endolysin comes from the inside to the outside. I guess uh, not in every phage and holding can be predicted, but uh, the majority of the phage lysin systems which have now been described all rely on a kind of holding to get through the inner membrane. So it's not due to this amphiphatic helix, but I cannot exclude it uh, because there are some phages where a holing cannot be found, and, and there the, the phages, uh, the phage light system is not yet um, uh, elaborated or unraveled. Right. Even we worked on a recently we worked on a mycobacterial phage, it just shows holing independent uh, lysine. Yeah, Maybe exactly. There, there are a few of them, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so another question is many OMPs, which are actually AMPs, I don't know what AMP is, failed in clinical yeah. trials of toxicity to human cells. So is this taken into consideration in your collection of OMPs? Yeah. Uh, so an, an, an AMP is an antimicrobial uh, peptide. It's, it, it falls under the class of OMPs, which is a more general term for the outer membrane permalizing peptides. And it's true that many AMPs uh, have cytotoxic effects because they're not specific for the bacterial membrane or the eukaryotic membrane, uh, because they can oligomerize and they can depolarize the, the membrane. This is, of course, not what we want. Um, 
we we took that in account when selecting the peptide but not in all cases this information was available in the literature so it's definitely something you automatically check in the end for example the lead license that came forward in our study uh, and, um, against Asimbertum Pomani is has been tested in the meantime and it's not cytotoxic. Why do I think that at least the majority of such peptides will not be cytotoxic? It's because they have to oligomerize. And when they oligomerize, uh, they, they make these spores. But if there is a big other molecule fused to that, the CBD and the EID, I think it will be many, many cases difficult to still oligomerize. And that's why the cytotoxicity disappears. Okay. Um, so there's one, two questions from uh, uh, there together. One is, uh, have you applied these uh, licenses to any gram-positive uh, bacteria? And in some combination, probably there was no linker between EAD and CBD. So why was there no linker in that mm -hmm. configuration? Yeah. Uh, we are doing work on gram-positive as well, and because it's easily applicable also on this license. And the question says there's no link between the EID and CBD, but I should mention that we delineate the tile as such that the natural linker of the endolyzin is always included in the most N-terminal uh, part. So when we start from a modular endolysin with a CBD and an EAD of a gram-negative lysin, then the CBD tau will comprise the natural linker. So there, we didn't foresee an additional linker, but between all the CBD EAD fusions, there is a natural linker of 10 amino acids already present. So it's not a direct fusion that would not work, eh? but when you design an experiment or a new study, and you design the, the boundaries of your building blocks, you have to think very smart and wise about that, and you have to take the right decisions. And it's a difficult job, it's empirical, and you, you have to, to use a bit your intuition, and you often make mistakes also, of course, but the best way is to include the natural linker in the delineation of the tiles. But I, I'm, I'm sure that playing with different linkers can have an effect. As today I've shown an example, I think in the middle of the presentation, where you could see that lengthening the linker increases the activity. So there we could see a good effect. But at the same time, I've also shown the, the results of Artelizin 175. There, there is no linker between the peptide and the endolysin. So it's, it's always empirical. Every design rule that you seem to find, there's always an exception. So it's still empirical research. And when you design a new study, you have to think with all the knowledge you have and to, to interact on that and to spend some time on that because that's a really important job. But once you have done this design, you have to test it and then it's empirical and you will learn from what you see in every situation is, is different. I cannot yet give general design rules in terms of the linkers. I guess we will be able to do so in, in five or 10 years or so when we test more and more. Uh, but at the moment, it's, it, it's, I think there's still much research needed to, uh, to investigate the role of linkers in, in protein science in general. Okay, great. Okay, now this, this question is on enolysins. So you fuse RB receptor binding proteins with endolysins and uh, very often phage, uh, they undergo mutation and there's a resistance because of to the, to the receptor binding protein. So in that case, do you see that phenolysin might suffer because of fusion with RPPs? Yeah, that is true. So this, this publication has now been recently published. We didn't test yet the resistance uh, that can um, originate. And, and I expect it will be indeed a little bit like with stages at that that with some point mutations that you can uh, get resistant to this. But it, I, I think it will then depend on either making cocktails as well, like phage cocktails, but also by selecting receptor binding proteins that target outer membrane proteins that are also virulence factors. And that if they become resistant, that this mutation also is correlated with a lot of virulence. And then, then you can circumvent this, this, this problem. 
but that's for sure something that has to be investigated. Um, there, what that, there, the the resistance development is uh, at the same level, I think, with uh, the challenge with phages. Eh? So, but as with phages, there are some solutions for that uh, to try to circumvent that. Okay, and a related question is: Are these licenses uh, host specific? When they are attached to RBP or even without RBP, they can be host specific. I mean, uh, when they are, of course, independent of RBP. Yeah. The, so the license itself, uh, in this case, it was from an E. coli phage, D5. But um, the license itself is not specific. The reason for that is that all gram negatives have the same chemical composition of the peptide like. And I've shown a slide with the A1 gamma chemotype, and this is the conserved chemotype. So, I'm sure that, that an inner lysine can also be made from using a pseudomonas lysine, uh, but using a receptor binding protein of E. coli, and that you can make it specific for E. coli. So it's a, the, the RBP, the receptor binding protein, that it makes it uh, specific. But if, if you would read the paper uh, in the discussion section, we also discussed that we do not understand yet how this inner lysine works. Because this inner lysine is probably larger than the pore of this outer membrane protein. So in the beginning, we thought likely it will go through the pore and then it reaches the, the, the petaplasm and there it will degrade the peptide glycan. But that is an, that hypothesis is not so plausible, I think. In fact, we do not know yet. And maybe it's just bringing it in the proximity and that the end lysine can penetrate the outer membrane at the, at the boundary between the protein and the outer leaflet of the outer membrane. I, I guess that's the weak spot. And if you just get a few lysine molecules through this weak spot in the outer membrane, I think it can work. So it, it, it looks like this RBP brings it to the, the Achilles heel of the outer membrane. In, in the electron microscopy images we have published, you see that the damage is mostly also at at the at the septum or mostly at the at the at the, the ends um, uh, of the, the cell uh, of the rod. So there's still much to discover there with the analyzing. It's definitely worthwhile to explore that uh, further. Right. Okay, this is an interesting question. Uh, not uh, does swelling of the cell especially this especially distances the membrane proteins which endolysins bind to does increasing accessibility and thereby the increasing the cell lysis as in when the cells swell so maybe there's a stretching of membrane and there's a spatial distance yeah. between the membrane proteins and to which endolysins bind to and hence there is a better uh, access of endolysins to uh, the peptide of mm -hmm. I, I did not fully get the question. There was some line interruption, but if you, if I got correctly, um, if you have a CBD that targets the peptide like, and then we saw that there was a higher myelolytic activity. But what we also found out in the recent years is that there is no correlation between myelolytic activity and antibacterial activity. You would think that that a high myelolytic activity like the, the top one in the table that I've shown you is, is the best one to make a, a lysine targeting gram negatives, but it's, it is not the case. Um, this, the CBD is often also not essential. So um, if that uh, answers the, the question. Okay, this is, uh, is it possible to form an oligopeptide with multiple RBDs and uh, so that it could increase the efficiency of the attack? I mean, a broad spectrum, maybe multiple hosts it can attack to. So to form oligopeptides with the RBP. That um, would be not possible, I think, because RBP is a whole uh, native protein in itself. Yeah. It's true that RBP often oligomerizes in the phage structure. And we didn't investigate whether the, the inolysins are monomeric or uh, oligomeric. But it may be that the oligomerization still take place uh, in the inolysin, and that 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 is a, a, a clue to success that it's needed. But that that's uh, also not yet investigated. All right.
okay so few more questions um you you may let me know when you want to stop taking questions because i think i'm getting them continuously so should we go ahead i see a lot of i see a lot of questions in the in the chat list but i would recommend the people that we, which question is not addressed in this talk that they, they can always contact me later on uh, yeah. if they want to have a chat on it right, right. that would be okay yeah so this is very specific to i think you've addressed it but still i'll take this does the position tax contain sites for any restriction enzyme i think it does and or is it self complementary uh, the you have an enzyme bsa1 in the uh, in the tax you have position tax you have a site for a restriction enzyme yeah okay uh first part of the question no it is position tax did in our case not comprise a restriction recognition site. Um, it's not needed. Um, we, but the point is you can fully flexibly uh, choose yourself what this position tag is. The most important thing is that the position tag is always a, multi, a multiple of three nucleotides, a multiple of a codon, so that you have in frame fusion. So in this project that I've shown here, we choose for glycine serin alanin because it's flexible. But we have other projects in the lab where we use uh, proline and treonin to have a very rigid um, linker. Sometimes that can be important. If in your design it's important to have a recognition site there, you can also choose a recognition site. But the, the message is that you can fully choose yourself. Second part of the question, we use then the BSA1. The BSA1 is not in the tiles, but it's in the entry vector. And the BSA1 is used to assemble all the pieces together. And therefore, it's important that the BSA1 is not cleaving inside the sequences of the tile themselves. So that's the only sequence dependency we have that all the tiles you make, you have to make sure that the BSA1 recognition sequences are not present in those. If there is one, you have to do a mutation or something else, a silent mutation, to remove it. All right. This is regarding the half-life of the engineered enzymes. So uh, what is the half-life of the engineer, engineered endolysins in human serum? And also, mm -hmm. how do, uh, what do you think, how do these natural gram-negative endolysins lose their activity in human serum? Uh, um, you, I mean, what is the half-life of the engineered endolysis human serum is yeah. one question, and how so do natural license lose their activity? Yeah, we didn't test the half-life of these uh, engineered license, but uh, other reports in, in literature give uh, half lives between 10 minutes to a few hours. So it's not long, and that I remember 10 10 years ago, it was maybe still a concern in the Leiden field. It's a protein, so it's quickly removed from the body. It can elicit an immune reaction or an allergic reaction. But all of these concerns seem to be solved. Although it's only very short in the bloodstream, for example, these this Leiden's act so quickly that they have done their action that it's even good that it's removed because it, it acts quickly and then it's removed. And, and, and in spite of the short high bar, half-life of, of 10 minutes or a few hours uh, in vivo models uh, always seems to be uh, successful. Also, the immune response, in the meantime, it has been shown that antibodies are elicited. If you inject a rabbit with a lysine, you will find uh, uh, antibodies against that. But the interesting thing is that even pre-immunized animals uh, can still be treated successfully with uh, a license. And that, that's even more amazing, I think. There's not yet a, a fully experimentally proven explanation for that, but the most common hypothesis in the field is again the same, that these license act so quickly that they have killed the bacteria before a circulating antibody has inactivated uh, the license. And the third concern was allergic reaction. Also there, a few phase one clinical trials have been done now uh, for different lysins. And in none of these clinical trials, allergic reactions have been reported. So although it's a, a non-native protein, um, allergic reactions do not occur on the large scale. But it, I can imagine if you treat a million of patients with lysins, there, there will be a few 
that are allergic, just like that you can allergic against penicillin, for example. Allergic, and do you suspect your immunogenic response as well? Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's a protein of 15,000 uh, uh, Dalton, 200 amino acids. It's, it's non-native, it's uh, unknown by the human body, so there will be an, an immune response. But there are also people that are working on that, that, that you try to mask it with uh, pegulation or with formulation in liposomes. But once the, the immune system is exposed to a protein, is a protein then I, I assume there will be an immune response. If, I, if you mean the, the antibody immune response, there can also be an immune response uh, based on the cell debris that is caused by the action of the lysine. Eh? If you kill the bacteria and there is a full explosion of the cell, there may be a lot of cell wall remnants that, that uh, activate the innate immune response. And so far, it doesn't seem to be a problem in the clinical studies, but there are uh, two papers that compare the effects of an overdose of lysine and a small dose of lysine. If you have a large dose of lysine that you continuously apply to the patient intravenously, then you will not only kill the cells, but you will also completely fragmentize the cell wall remnants to very small fragments. And then you have more and more fragments. And then they saw an increase in the pro-inflammatory response, which is in fact negative. But in another study where they use a single dose, a low dose, there they see a reduction of the pro-inflammatory response. So they added just enough to kill the cells, and by removing the blood, you see an, a reduction of the pro-inflammatory response. So I think once it, it, it's approved and it will be used in, in applications or in humans, then dosing will be very important. Uh, it's not the goal, you just have to kill the bacteria, but not cut it in a zillion pieces that will uh, over excitate uh, the immune system. Okay. So I'll take with this, I will take the last question. Uh, with, and after that, we will wrap the session. So this is um, how come the lysins don't lyse the cells from within when expressed in E. coli? When they're expressed as recombinant proteins inside yeah. E. coli cells? Considering That's a good that. Question that allow them to permeate the membrane. Yeah. It, I must say the majority of engineered lysins that we produce um, do not lyse E. coli, but we see that also occasionally. Um, I think it depends on, on, you have to know the outer membrane has a completely different structure than the cytoplasmic yes. membrane. And the peptides that we add are specific for the outer membrane and they have cationic charges and so on but also hydrophobic residues. I think if the peptide is too hydrophobic, then you have an increased chance that during expression in the coli, it can also permeate the inner membrane, and then you get the toxic uh, reaction, and the coli will die, and you will have no protein. So in general, we don't have much protein expression, um, but we have enough to do our tests, and we don't see toxicity. But it's also frequent that we have variants that, that kill the cell, and then you see that there is no biomass formation and that there is no growth. And, and basically, these drop out of our assays because we cannot produce them and analyze them in the assay how we do it now with the coli. But it's an issue. It's something you have to keep in mind that, that this can happen. Some, yeah, some do, some don't. Right. And any, any thoughts on the license, uh, permeability of license for mycobacterium? Mm -hmm. uh, for exogenous application, like you have actualized. Yeah, I think I would say it like that. The, 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 the license targeting gram positives have been, in fact, invented in the beginning of the millennium. And the license targeting the gram negatives came 10 years later. And I think, given the high urgency to find solutions for mycobacterium, I think uh, that the community has also do a lot of effort to, to further engineer them. That, uh, that they can also cross the very complicated barrier of mycobacteria. But basically, I think it must be possible. But uh, research will be needed there. All right, we are seeing several thank you messages. Because the participants are extremely happy and they have wonderful notes. Mm -hmm. So may I just request now, uh, maybe uh, uh, 
Can I please request uh, Dr. Pavan Sharma? He is the president of uh, Open Health System Laboratory. And uh, Dr. Sharma, are you there? Uh, Dr. Pavan Sharma, are you there? Ah, he's here. So I would request him to now please thank. Uh, you can unmute yourself. And um, um, before that, uh, yeah. So Dr. Pavan Sharma, uh, Vijay, are you happy your questions were taken? <laughs> okay, so sir, please um, formally wrap this session and uh, please extend a very warm thanks to Okay. Thank you very much, Eve. This is a very fascinating talk you have uh, given. And I think, uh, like me, there are many people who have also learned uh, quite a lot about, uh, uh, you know, about the subject. We have uh, heard about uh, file therapy and, and things like that, but we are never excited about it because the specificity of the phages and the lysines single license, single bacteria, not only, I mean, single strain of bacteria. So to that extent, I think the applicability was very limited. But your work has uh, completely changed that. I mean, you are, this is a paradigm shift now. I think the, the amount of uh, work you have brought in and the kind of, uh, the huge, tremendous diversity which you create within, uh, you know, the license as such, I think they, that opens up a huge, I mean, a very tremendous possibility of probably targeting uh, any, uh, any bacteria, for example, any pathogen, uh, bacterial mm -hmm. microbial pathogen. I think to, to that extent, I think this expands at least our own thinking, the horizon that yes, we are, we can go there where we thought that was not possible to go. So I, I really thank you for giving this very fascinating talk and uh, educating us on uh, on the principles of uh, protein engineering and how do you really put together A and B. You know, there is There are enzymes here and there are, uh, uh, you know, a kind of uh, targets different there, but when you put them together, so they, that, that you can create such a versatile uh, uh, kind of system which can take care of, uh, I would say, innumerable possibilities, and and they can uh, they can be very very useful. So I'm I'm very overwhelmed, and uh, I think I will have to go through your uh, talk again to to really absorb it fully. And but one thing is clear that field has become really open, and this is. This is the, I think this is fast getting to a place where it is getting the respect which it deserves. I think people have been dismissing, very dismissive of five therapy, but I think after hearing you, I am sure that the, the thinking will change and people will come to respect uh, this, uh, uh, this aspect also, this kind of approach also uh, to address the uh, very burning uh, problem of antimicrobial resistance. So I thank you very much. And I join many of the participants, actually, who are thanking you very profusely. I join them all to, to thank you. And uh, and we hope to listen to from you sometime more in future. I thank you very much. Yeah, Thank you very much for this nice work, Mr. Shama.